Hey grade 12s and welcome to our final preparation for our NEC exam papers for mathematical literacy in the Metro North Education District. So today we're going to just have a basic overview and a look at what to expect, how to approach the papers, how to plan and then also how to best use the resources available on this platform. So if we start, what you should expect, you'll be writing two papers, it will be 150 marks each. Each paper will be three hours and there will be known and unknown contexts in both papers. So you might be wondering what is considered to be a known context. So if we just have a look at that, examples of known contexts, you can get these from your exam guideline. That's the 2021 version. And you'll see here, I just copied some of these for you into this presentation so that you can familiarize yourself with the types of questions that would be considered known context so remember question one to three would normally be known context and then question four and or five will have some unknown contexts in it if we look at paper two we look at the weighting the topics that you'll need to study for this paper will be maps plans and scale 40 percent of the paper measurement 55 percent of the paper and then the same story about probability that will be incorporated into these two topics. If we look at the layout of paper two, again, question one, level one, easy to score. Let's make sure we start with that one. Question two, maps and plans, three, measurement, and then four and or five integrated questions, little bit of this, little bit of that, and then also some probability. Now that you know what to expect in the papers, how it's going to look, we need to think about how we are going to prepare for the exam. So some practical things that you can use, the examination guideline, I spoke about this, examples that you've done in your workbook or in your textbook, um, examples in the Mind the Gap book, uh, past papers that you can find on the ePortal, the weekly WCED lessons where they explain concepts and they are examples, telematics broadcasts and other TV broadcasts for the subject, have a look at the revision material, which you know was done per term. Go through your terminology booklets because they do like to ask definitions in some cases. And then also you can work through recordings of our past MNET tutoring sessions. So when we are in the exam session, so the day of the paper, what do we need to do? So first of all, we need to use the 10 minutes of reading time before we start to plan our approach. So what we mean by that is you need to start with the questions that you can answer and then move on to the rest. So we spoke about that briefly earlier, but remember that that's an important strategy that you can decide on on the day in that session. You do not have to answer the questions in the correct order. So chronologically, you don't have to do one, then two, then three, then four. You can do one and then three and then two or however you feel on the day. You do, however, have to complete a whole question at a time before moving on to the next question. If we look at the day of the paper. It's also so important for you to write down all the steps and I'll show you guys a little bit later why that's so important. So another thing on the day of the paper that you cannot forget is to bring some pens, to bring your calculator and then also to bring a ruler if it's about drawing a graph or if it's about measuring in paper two. The ruler is a very 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 important part of our exam papers. The last thing that you cannot forget at home is a positive can-do attitude. So we are not going to leave any gaps. We are going to attempt every question that we see in our exam paper. So when we are in the exam venue, what are we going to get? So that's something we sometimes stress about. So you'll see for this section of the presentation, I've used past papers just to give you an idea. If we look at this, you'll get a question paper. You guys will see it's the 2021 paper. You will most probably get an addendum and the addendum will have some annexures in it. So you need to remember to use the annexures for the specified questions. And just to show you guys, here it tells you, use the annexures. So annexure A for 2.2, annexure C for 4.3. So you need to make sure that when you are answering these questions, you are actually referring to the annexures and you have that booklet open next to you. 
then you are probably also going to get an answer sheet if they want you to draw a graph. So when they ask you to draw a graph, you need to do this on the answer sheet and this must be handed in along with your answer booklet that you will be receiving. And here you can see it also tells you which question must be done on the answer sheet. So now that you know what to expect, what's going to be there, how are we going to approach the paper? We're going to look for keywords. Keywords can be words like calculate, determine, identify, suggest, and there's an explanation for you. This is also in the Mind the Gap of basically, if you see the word calculate, what do you know you're going to have to do? It's a numerical answer. So you're going to have to do some calculation. You have to show your working. So make sure that you look out for keywords. And we're going to have a quick look at how we can make sense of questions using keywords. So if I look at this example, this is again from a past paper, it tells you a total amount of 400,000 Rand was budgeted for the marking team at this particular marking center. So what are the keywords we are looking for? Verify. That means that at the end we are going to say, therefore, yes, it was or no, it was not. So verify whether. Whether means it can be or it can't be. This amount is sufficient. What does sufficient mean? It means enough to pay the team for. And then they tell you the three things that you will need to consider. So see how just taking some time to read the question carefully gives us an idea of what to approach, what to take into consideration, what we must work out and how we must answer the question. If we look at another example, again from a past paper, here's a table. Remember, they will tell you what information to use from the table in the question. The first question says, identify the candidates. So when it says the candidates, we are going to have to refer to their names, whose test scores in both tests, so we are looking at both sets of data, differed by 30%. So now we know what we need to look at. The next question again says, calculate so there's going to have to be something that we're going to have to work out the value of the interquartile range so they're giving you a suggestion of what to do for test two so now we know we are only going to look at this part of the work so look how just approaching the questions in a good way helps you to know exactly how to answer them I told you earlier it's important to write down all your steps so why is it important look at this it's a long question but you get marks for every single step that you do so it's important to write down all the steps because you can get marks for steps that you performed and accurate parts of the calculation even if your final solution even if your final answer is not correct you can still get five out of six or four out of six so don't just try and write down the final answer Try to show your steps to show the marker how you got to the answer that you got to. So now that you have this idea of what to do, how to approach the questions, how are we going to use the resources on this platform to best prepare you for your final exam? We are going to start by watching the explanation video that would be made by one of our very, very, very capable and experienced tutors. Then after you've watched the explanation video, you are going to independently try to complete the worksheet. You will see these are context-based. A lot of them are from past papers. And then after you've done the worksheet, you are going to watch the video where the worksheet is marked and you are going to see how you fared and maybe see if you need to spend a little bit of extra time revising or going through more work on a specific topic or if you have grasped and mastered the basic skills for those topics. If we just look at the basics first, so you need to know that there's two measurement systems that are being used around the world. The first one would be the metric system, and this is now the one that we use in South Africa. So millimeters, meters, kilograms, uh, liters, all of that. Now, what you need to remember is you need to know this off by heart. So that means you need to know how do I convert from grams to kilograms? When do I multiply with a thousand? When do I divide by a thousand? How many milliliters are there in a liter? These, inf these types of things, so this information will not be provided to you in your exam. You need to know this so that you can apply it in your exam. 
Then we also get the imperial system. And then we are talking about things like pounds and ounces and inches and feet and that kind of thing. And then you will be provided with a conversion factor. So just a quick example to put it in perspective for you. If we look at something like this, this is something we got off the internet about um, travel and how big your suitcase should be. And if we look at something like this, here, this suitcase has dimensions in both centimeters and inches. So it obviously depends on the country and who's using it, um, which one they would be using. So these are obviously measurements of length or height. And this is therefore what we are going to need to be able to do. Convert from the metric system to the imperial system or convert from the imperial system to the metric system. So if we look at our first question, we'll see here, it says convert the lady's height to inches. So we see here, we've got the lady's height as 163 centimeters. But now remember, inches will be imperial. So we said here we have our conversion factors. One centimeter is 0 0.393701 inches, or one inch is 2.54 centimeters. Remember, it can be given to you in either one of these versions. These are just basically the inverses of one another. So it's showing the same thing, just written in a different format. Now, if I decide to use the first one, one centimeter is 0 0.393701 inches. Now I need to convert the lady's height, so this 163 centimeters, to inches. So I'll put centimeters by centimeters, inches by inches. I don't know her height in inches. So we are going to divide up and we are going to multiply across. So it's going to be 163 divided by 1 times this 0 0.393701 inches. And that gives you the lady's height as 64,17 inches. We used the conversion factor that was provided. We substituted the value that was provided in. And then we calculated the missing value. Now, if we look at the second example, it now says convert the man's height to meters. But we need to remember over here, now we're seeing inches. And here we only have conversion factors to centimeters. Then you say, oh, but I can't do this because it's asking meters. Remember, within the metric system, you need to be able to convert off memory. So in other words, you need to know that one meter is equal to 100 centimeters. So if I convert from inches to centimeters, then I can further convert from centimeters to meters. So now I'm going to use the second conversion factor just because I feel like it. If they give you both, you can choose whichever one you want to use. So now I'm going to say one inch is 2,54 centimeters. Then I take the information that I have. It's 69 inches. So it needs to be written under inches and I don't know the centimeters yet. So I'm going to divide up and multiply across so it will be 69 divided by 1 times 2,54 and then I get 175,26 centimeters um, being the man's height. But the question said we must determine the height in meters. So therefore we are now going to say, right, if a meter is 100 centimeters, I'm going to take this 100 centimeters and I'm, I'm or, sorry, rather, I'm going to take the centimeters and divide by 100 to get to meters. So I'll take this answer we got, divide by 100, and then I get 1,75 meters being the man's height. If we just look at another example of application types of contexts. So here's just an example of a recipe. They like to give us things like this. So if we look at this, for instance, convert the mass of the flour to kilograms. So if I have a look at this, I find flour, 500 grams. It's so easy because it's just within the metric system. So no conversion factor is given because it's from memory. So we'll say, right, one kilogram is a thousand grams. So I'm going to say 500 grams 
divide by a thousand to make it kilograms and then i get sorry i see i didn't put the answer in here 0 0.5 kilograms that would be the mass of the flour in kilograms now if i look at the next question it says convert the amount of butter needed to milliliters if one milliliter is 0 0.96 grams so if i go to butter I see it's 75 grams, but now I have a conversion factor. So, one milliliter is 0 0.96 grams. That was given to you. That's the conversion factor. We need to convert to milliliters. So, we'll have question mark milliliters and the 75 I got from here. Now, we need to remember we are going to divide up and multiply across. So, 75 Divide by 0 0.96 times 1 gives me the milliliter equivalent of 78,125 milliliters of butter that is needed. If I look at the next type of question, convert the temperature to the nearest 10 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, they will then give you a formula. So here we go. Degrees Fahrenheit is 1,8 times degrees celsius so now we go look for the temperature i see it's 200 so i know um, this 200 is going to be substituted in here now what is very important for us to remember is bod mass learners we often find in exams that you just try to do everything in one step and then you get a completely wrong answer so what we are doing here is we are going to first take the 1,8 times the 200 giving me 360 plus then the 32 bod mass and that gives me 392 degrees fahrenheit but remember it said to the nearest 10 degrees so therefore in this case it will be rounded to 390 degrees remember we also get a rounding mark when they tell us to round specifically so if we look at another question calculate the amount of sugar needed in ounces to make 60 scones so now if they ask us an ounces we know they need to give us a conversion factor but now it says 60 scones now we're not sure what is happening so first of all go back to the recipe it says it makes one dozen we know that one dozen is 12 so if i need to make 60 and i divide it by 12 it means this recipe will need to be repeated five times so if i go to the sugar now it's 75 grams but i know i'll need to repeat the recipe five times so it's going to be 75 grams times five giving me 375 grams that i need now i can use my conversion factor grams by grams the answers is the question mark so by now we know we're going to divide up and multiply cross and then we get 2,64555 ounces of sugar needed to make 60 scones. So I'm showing you guys in all these examples how these questions can be asked in different ways. We would now recommend that you start with the worksheet, that you try that, and that you after that look at the solutions to the worksheet. So if we look at the questions, the first question, nice and easy, said, Convert 1,56 kilograms to grams. So we know now that we'll have to multiply with 1,000. And then we get 1,560 grams. Question 1.1.2 says, write in simplified ratio form the mass of raisins to the mass of butter. So if we look at this, we'll see you write raisins to butter because they said raisins first. We will write raisins on the left and then we'll write the butter on the right of our ratio. And then what is important is we can see from here that it's in the same unit. So no conversions need to be done. If they weren't in the same unit, you'd first need to convert. But there we have it, nice and easy. Then it says we must write in a simplified ratio form. So in this case, it's actually quite easy because 125 goes into both values. So if I divide both sides by 125, 
So I'm going to do the same on both sides. I get a simplified ratio of 1 is to 5. So remember when we look at these kind of ratios, there's no units in here. And we have to check if they ask for simplified ratio form. And we have to double check which one has to be written on the left and which one has to be written on the right of my ratio. Then if we move on, calculate the number of cups of bran flour needed if Mrs. Bester bakes 8 kilograms of rusks. So once again, we go back to this. It says, these are the main ingredients to bake 5,000 grams. So what is something we need to remember? Here we have grams, here we have kilograms. There needs to be a conversion of these units. So um, if we look at this, we have 6,25 cups for five kilograms because 5,000 grams if we divide that by a thousand is equal to five kilograms so I'm just going to show you once again how we can use this method that we've been using so now we know we want an answer for eight kilograms so I can write the eight kilograms below the five kilograms because kilos go with kilos in this case cups will go with cups then we know our method is going to be divide up, multiply across. So 8 divided by 5 times 6,25 gives me an answer of 10 cups. So grade 12, uh, just a reminder, I am using this method, but you can use any other method you want to use. You could have worked out how many cups I need for 1 kilogram and then multiply it by 8. As long as you show all your steps, and you get to the right answer, we will give you all the marks that are due to you. If we now look at 1.1.4, calculate the mass of raisins needed to bake a 450 gram pack. So if we look here, it says raisins, 125 grams for a 5,000 gram pack. So if we have 125 grams in a 500 gram um pack of um, rusks now they want to know in a 450 gram pack so here we have the packs i'm just going to write this here and here we have the raisins so now you know by now divide up where we have the two values multiply across so 450 divide 5000 times 125 gives me 11,25 grams of raisins needed if we move on to the next question, it's then asking us to convert from Fahrenheit to Celsius. And as I explained in the previous video, it's so important for you to do bot mass and to remember your bracket. So I've taken the 430 degrees, I've substituted into where the Fahrenheit is, then I first subtract these two from each other, I get 398, then I still divide by 1,8 and I get 221 comma one one degrees celsius if we look at the next question in this worksheet it was about miss bagley's sugar intake so the first question says calculate the missing values a and b so here we can see for a it's for the monster drink and it tells you that there's 57,3 grams of sugar per milliliter now we need to know how many calories there are. And then for B, we know the calories, but we must work back to find the number of grams. So if you look at all the information given, here's something quite important. One gram of sugar is four calories. So if we know that one gram of sugar is four calories, we know that this drink has 57,3 grams per milliliter. So we'll need to take for A, the value given times by 4, giving me 229,2 calories. And then for B, because we have the calories, we'll have to do the inverse or the opposite. So I'll take the calories. I'll now divide by 4, which is the information we got over here. And then I get 42,3 grams. If we look at 3.2.2, it says determine the total amount of sugar in grams that will be consumed by Miss Bagley if she drinks three cans of Monster per week. So we go to the Monster, we see how many grams of sugar, we multiply by three, 
and we get 171,9 grams. If we move on to 3.2.3, here you guys will see it's a bit of a longer question. So it says, Miss Bagley decided to be more health conscious and changed her drinks too. Now we need to see. Two 500 ml vitamin waters per day. So we're going to use vitamin water and it's per day. And one 500 ml energade per week. So this is important. And we need to look at the energade as well. So the question says, verify by showing of your calculations whether her sugar intake per week is now 56,4% of the previous intake. So remember, the previous intake is what we worked out in the previous question where she was drinking, um, I think it was three cans of Monster. So if we look at this, the vitamin water, if we look at this, it gives us 5,5 grams per milliliter. So we're going to use the 5,5 grams and I'm multiplying it by 2 because she has 2 a day. And then I'm multiplying it by 7 because it is going to be for the week. Remember, the question asked per week. So I multiplied that by 7. So then I got 77 grams that she's taking in just from the vitamin water. But now we need to remember she's going to have one energate. So that's why I'm adding the energate, which gives me a total sugar intake now of 97 grams in a week. But they're asking us to verify whether her sugar intake is 56,4% of the previous intake. So you're going to use your answer you got in 322 two, and you are going to say, all right, Therefore, 97, which is a new one, over the old sugar intake, because it must be in percentage, we're going to multiply by 100. We get 56,4. So therefore, the statement was valid. And then calculate the total mass of sugar in kilograms that will be consumed by one person in one year. Drinking two 330 ml cans of Coke daily. So we're going to go to Coca-Cola. We're going to see it's 35 grams. We know it's two of these per day. So therefore, it's 70 grams in a day. Therefore, for a year, we are multiplying with 365, giving me a total in grams of 25,550. But we are not done because it asks us in kilograms. So we now know we must divide by a thousand, giving me 25,55 kilograms. And then the last question says, suggest two ways on how Ms. Bagley can reduce her sugar intake. So this is now not something you might have been taught. This is where you need to stop and reflect and think a little. So here I gave examples like she can switch to sugar-free drinks or she can start drinking more water. If you had anything else that makes sense, you will be also be um, awarded your marks for this. So let's have a look at things that we need to remember or things that we need to keep in mind when we are going to tackle questions on area with costing. Also important to remember that theory and practice are linked together. So we need to practice and we need to know our theory. So what is important to remember? And the following things I'm going to uh, remind you about, you need to know them at the tip of your fingertips. Understand and be able to use formula. Perimeter, what is the definition? Area, what's the definition? So when I am now naming all of these things, you must actually run it through your mind. Diameter, what's the meaning? Radius, what's the meaning of radius? Total surface area. What is that again? Conversions. You need to know conversions. And how do we remember all of these things that I've mentioned now? We study them. That's how we're going to remember them. All right, so let's have a look at the first question. After each tennis match, the organizers of the Wimbledon Championship give the players a can of cool drink. Coca-Cola cans are packed in a rectangular box in such a way 
that their circular tops touch each other as shown below. So there they show us how they touch. Then they give you formula and they give you notes. First question says, calculate the area to the nearest centimeter squared of one top of one uh, can in the box. All right, that's also our hint. Then we go and look at the formula and we see that they gave us a formula for a circle, pi radius squared. We go and have a look at the can of Coke and we see we have a slight problem, but we can fix it. The problem is every all the dimensions were given to us in millimeters. So we're going to take the 65 millimeters and divide it by 10, and the answer is then 6.5 centimeters. We write down the formula, pi radius square, and we see the radius, the radius is required in the formula. So the 6.5 is the diameter. So we are going to half that, and the answer is then 3,25, and we need to square that, and then the answer is 33.187 centimeters squared. And of course, they did ask to the nearest centimeter, and therefore it will be 33 centimeters squared because the first digit after the comma was a one, so there's no influence on the three. All right, then the next question says, determine the dimensions in centimeter of the base of the box. All right, so there's the box, that's the length of the box, and that is the breadth of the box. So now they ask us to determine the dimensions of this specific box. All right, and the, what we need to understand is that it is 65 millimeters from the side of the tin to the other side, which is the diameter, and again from there to there will be 65, and there to there. So it will, to work out the length of the box, we will say 65 millimeters times one, two, three, four, five, six. And that will give us 390 millimeters. And they did ask for the conversions to, or the answer to be in centimeters. So that is 39 centimeters. Then we will do exactly the same to work out the width. It will be 65 millimeters from there to there, and from there to there, we will times it by three because there's three cans in the width of the box, which is 995 millimeters. And if we do the conversion to centimeter, it's 19.5 centimeters. All right, let's move along to the next question. Calculate the total surface area of the can in centimeters squared. So they gave us a net, it's a flattened out representation of the can. And they gave us a, a formula for the surface area of a cylinder. Of course, the Coke can is a cylinder. All right, so we're going to write down our formula. And we need to remember that pi is 3.142. And also remember that all our measurements must be in centimeters because I ask that the surface area must be calculated in centimeters squared. We're going to substitute into the formula. 2 is part of the formula, 3,142 times the radius from the previous question. It's 3,25. Again, substitute the radius, 3,25 plus the height. The height was given to us in 112 millimeters. We convert it to centimeters because all measurement must be in centimeters. Very important if you substitute different units of measurement into a formula, it is a breakdown error immediately. So we're going to do our calculation. So we're first going to calculate what's in front of the bracket. That's the answer. We're going to calculate the bracket. We're going to add them together. And then we're going to multiply the 20.423 times the 14.45. Please remember bot mass. And the answer is 295.11235 centimeters squared, exactly as they ask. Then the next question says, calculate the cost excluding VAT of the al alumnia material needed for a dozen of cans. So let's go to the top. It says the cylind um, cylindrical can is made from alumnia. Um, aluminium and trace amounts of other materials. 
material that cost 22 rand 50, including VAT per dozen of cans. So what do they want? They want us to work out the price before they added VAT. Important to remember, 115% equals 22 rand 50. That is including VAT. In other words, the 15% VAT is already included in the 22 rand 50. So I'm going to work out the cost that exclude VAT. So I need to say 100 divided by 115 times the 22 rand 50. And then it is 19 rand 565. And remember, this is money. So I'm going to round it to two decimal places. So it's 19 rand 57 cents. Why? Because the 5 will have an influence on the 6. All right, let's move along to another question. The table tennis is a very popular sport at the Olympic Games. The diagram below shows the dimensions of a table tennis table. They give us a note that the net has an overhang of 15.25 centimeters on both sides. So there's a little overhang and there's a little overhang. Question number one, determine the length of the net in centimeters. So from the starting point of the net there until the end point, so we'll take the width of the table and we'll add the overhang and we'll add the overhang. And then the answer is 183 centimeters. The next question says calculate the difference between the length and the width of the table in millimeters. All right, be careful. All the measurements on this diagram have been given to us in centimeters. So the final answer must be converted to millimeters. So the difference between the length the length of the table and the width of the table, difference minus. So we're going to subtract them from one another. Our answer is then 1 to 1.5 centimeters. We're going to multiply it by 10 because remember, the final answer must be in millimeters, which will then be 1,215 millimeters. All right, let's move along to the next question. Table tennis players are serious about their fitness levels. A game started at 8 minutes past 10 and lasted for 1 hour and 58 minutes. At what time did the game end? So we take 8 minutes past 10, which is the time on a watch, plus a duration, 1 hour and 58 minutes. So to make it easy for yourself, you can say 8 minutes past 10, plus one hour, which will then bring you to eight minutes past 11. And then you can add the 58 minutes, which then will be the end. At what time did the game end? At six minutes past 12. Remember, it's time on a watch. Therefore, we write it with a colon. The next question. One of the players argues that the height of the table from the bottom the ground up to the top of the net is 60 centimeters less than the width of the table. So they give us measurements from the ground up to the table top is 76 centimeters. And then we need to add the height of the net, which is 15.25, because they said up to the top of the net is 60 centimeters less than the width of the table. Proof with calculations whether his argument is valid. So let's go and have a look if it's valid or not. So we're going to take the 76 centimeters from the ground to the tabletop plus the net, which will give us 91.25 centimeters. Then we take the 152.5 centimeters, the width of the table, minus what we just worked out, and then our answer is 61.25 centimeters. And then we need to now compare it with what the person said. So the person said that uh, one of the players argues that the height of the table from the bottom up to the top of the net is 60 centimeters less than the width. So it's not 60 centimeters, it's 61.25. So therefore, the statement is not valid. Um, grade 12s, when they ask you that you need to prove with calculations, then we prove with calculations and we must not forget to come to either the statement is valid or the statement is 
not valid. All right, so let's go and have a look at another example. A mathematical literacy teacher is making teaching aids for a lesson on measurement. For her classroom, she draws the shapes that's on the screen. She paints them and then she sticks them to the classroom walls. The shape below what dimensions is one of her teaching aids. All right, so first question, define the term area. This is work theory that must be studied. Total space taken up by a flat 2D surface. All right, then we move along to the next question that you need to calculate the total area of the shape in meters square. That's our hint. We realize that all the measurements on the diagram is in centimeters. We also realize that we don't have a formula for a shape that looks exactly like this, but we can break it up into shapes that we do know the formula for, and each one of the shapes here, they are all rectangles. So we're going to break them up. Doesn't matter how you break them up, I'm going to call this one A. Then I'm going to go and work out the total surface area of A. All right, it's length times breadth. 100 centimeters times 40 centimeters is 4,000 centimeters squared. I know the answer set that the answer must be in meters squared. I'm going to convert it at the end. I'm first sticking to what I have. Then I am going to go to shape B. Now shape B is 120 centimeters. That whole length is 60. We must minus 20. So that is 40. So it's 120 times 40 centimeters is 4,800 centimeters squared. Then we're going to move to C, and C is 60 times 20, 1,200 centimeters squared. You can, of course, if you want to, convert all of these measurements already to meters, um, and then your final answer will be in meters squared. So total area will be to add all of the measurements we worked out. So we're going to add them. And then our answer is in 10,000 centimeters squared. We're going to divide by 10,000. Why? Because remember, we are converting in area, units of area. So that's why it's divided by 10,000. And then our answer is 1 meter squared, exactly as they ask us to do. All right, let's continue to the next question. She paints this shape with two coats of paint and has prepared two of these shapes for her class. If one liter of paint covers 6.2 meters squared, determine, rounded off to two decimal places, the number of liters of paint required to paint two shapes. So we're first going to uh, work out the area to paint. So remember in the first question, we worked out that the area of one shape is one meter squared. Each one must get two coats and she's making two shapes. Then this answer will be four meters squared. Now we're going to go and work out the amount of liters that we're going to need to paint the two shapes with two coats. We take the four meters squared which we just worked out as the area that must be painted and we divide it where they tell us one, if one liter of paint covers, so that's the spread of the paint, we divide it by 6.2 meters squared and we get 0 0.645. They did say round off to two decimal places. So we're going to look at the third one. It's a five. It will have an influence on the four and therefore if the answer is 0 0.65 liters that will be needed to paint the shape two coats. All right, so let's answer the last question. The salesman at the hardware store stated that one 500 milliliter can of paint is not sufficient to paint the two shapes completely. Verify with calculations whether his statement is valid. So we'll take the previous answer of 0 0.65 liters, multiply by 1,000 to convert to milliliters so that we can compare our answers. 
The answer is then 650 milliliters, and therefore the statement of the salesperson is valid. We would now recommend that you start with the worksheet, that you try that, and that you after that look at the solutions to the worksheet. All right, let's start with the first question on the worksheet. On arrival in Vintuk, Pretty and her friends drove to the three-bedroom house they rented for the weekend. Use the information on Annex B to answer the questions that follow and calculate the unoccupied area of the plot. All right, unoccupied area of the plot. So the house, this is the house, it's standing on the plot and unoccupied means the space or the area which the house does not stand on. All right, so they give you the floor area is 73 square meters and they give you the lot area, the plot area, um, it's 179.0 square meters. They want the on, unoccupied area of the plot. In other words, we will then minus, subtract the two from one another, and the unoccupied area of the plot is 106 meters squared. All right, we are going to move along to 312. All the bedrooms have carpets, while the rest of the house is tiled. Calculate the total area covered with carpet. All right, so we are on the floor plan of the house. We see there's a master bedroom, there's a bedroom and a bedroom, and they all have carpets in. We also see that that bedroom there and this bedroom on the screen, they have exactly the same measurements. So we are first going to calculate the two bedrooms. Area is length times breadth. It's three meters times three meters, and we're going to multiply it by two, and the area for the bedroom one and two is 18 meters squared. Then we are going to calculate for bedroom three or the master bedroom. The measurements is three meters by 2.6 meters. Where do I get it from? On the floor plan, the measurements are given. And then that area for bedroom three or the master bedroom is 7.8 meters squared. So we're going to take the 18 meters squared, the 7.8 meters squared, and we're going to add it together to get the total area for all the bedrooms. And then the total area for the carpet rooms is 25.8 meters squared. All right, let's move along to the next two questions. Calculate the area to be tiled. So remember, in the previous question, we worked out the area of the three rooms and they had carpets in. And now they ask us to work out the area that must be tiled. So the total floor area of the house is 73 square meters. So we are going to take the 73 square meters and minus the 25.8 meters squared from the previous question. This is the the area, total area of the rooms with the carpets, and then the area to be tiled is 47.8 meters squared. All right, now the next question says the builder estimated that he needed less than 25 boxes to tile the house. Verify whether his estimation was valid if there are eight tiles in a box. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to work out the area of one tile. Where do I get this information? There's a note. The dimensions of the tiles are 0.5 meters by 0.5 meters. So this answer, area of one tile, is 0.25 meters squared. Then I'm going to work out the area to tile with one box. So I'm going to take the answer of one tile, multiply it by eight, because there's eight tiles in a box, and the answer is two meters squared. After that, I'm going to Calculate how many boxes will be needed. So I'm going to take the area to be tiled, the 47.8 meters squared, and divide it by 2 meters squared. Then I get 23.9. I'm going to round it to 24 boxes. Why? Because if I'm only going to buy 23, I will not have enough tiles. Therefore, the rounding up to 24 boxes. Now we still need to come to the conclusion of this question. So we need to say if his estimation was valid or not. So he said less than 25 boxes. So therefore, yes, his estimation was valid. All right, we're moving along to the next two questions on the worksheet. 
um, you are going to use Annexure D on your worksheet. Uh, convert the outer diameter of the large cylindrical vase to centimeters. So we are going to use this information on Annexure D. So we are going to calculate the outer diameter. We have a conversion factor. It's been given to us in inches. The conversion factor, one centimeter equals 0 0.393701 inches. So I'm going from inches to centimeters. So I am going to divide by the conversion factor. You are not going to round the conversion factor. You are using the whole conversion factor that was given and we will round our answer. So the diameter of the outside, uh, diameter of the vase is 50.01 centimeters. The next question says the designer decides to use the large cylindrical vase, calculate the surface area of this specific vase. Formula was given. The diameter was given as 50.01. We worked it out. The formula requires radius. So we're going to divide the diameter by 2 and the radius is 25.05 centimeters. We are going to substitute into our formula and we're going to make sure that our measurements are all the same in centimeters. And then our answer is 25,534.24858 centimeters squared and it will be rounded to two decimal places Therefore, the final answer, 25,534.25 centimeters squared. All right, so we come to the last three questions on the worksheet. The 323, determine the inner radius in centimeters of the large cylindrical vase. So that was the large cylindrical vase that was given to you. So I want to explain this by giving you a little diagram and this is a top view of the vase that they ask you to work out the inner radius. All right, they give us information here about thickness. So what do they mean about that? So on each side of the vase, you have a thickness of 1.5 centimeters and 1.5 centimeters. So from there, the information of the thickness. And we need to consider this when we work out the inner radius. So we're going to take the answer from the previous question, the 50.01 centimeters, and we're going to minus 3 centimeters, 1.5 and 1.5. Then our answer will be 47.01 centimeters. We're going to divide it by 2 because they ask for radius. So then the inner radius in centimeters will be 23.51. 324. Convert the thickness of the small cylindrical vase to meters. All right. So the thickness is 15 millimeters. We need to do the conversion to meters. So we'll take 15 millimeters, divide by 1,000, and the answer is 0 0.015 meters. Then the last question, calculate the inner height in meters of the small cylindrical vase. All right. So that is why they already ask us in this question to convert the 15 millimeters to meters. So we are then going to use that 1.2 meters minus 0 0.015 meters. And then the answer, the inner height in meters of the small cylindrical vase will then be 1.185 meters. There's a few things that we need to remember. Remember theory and practice go hand in hand. So if we know our theory, we will be able to do the questions. What is important to remember at the tip of our fingertips? Understand and be able to use formula. Volume, what's the definition? Capacity, what is the definition? What is the difference between volume and capacity? Diameter, what's the meaning? Radius, what's the meaning? Conversions, you must know how to do it, and the only way that you are going to know how to convert is to study it. So we're going to have a quick recap session. What is the difference between volume and capacity? So volume is a measure of how much 3D space an object takes up. 
in other words, the space in a shape. And capacity is the maximum amount that something can hold. In other words, amount of water that can be filled in the glass. We measure volume in units cubed, millimeters cubed, centimeters cubed, meters cubed, and we measure capacity in milliliters, liters, or kiloliters. So let's go and um, discuss the first question. Use the information in table one above and answer the following questions. Determine the height of the water in the vase for option one, if it is filled right up to the top. All right, so now we're just going to have a look at the information in table one. So we have a cylindrical vase and we have a rectangular base vase. So the question is based on option one. So they say determine the height of the water in the vase for option one, if it is filled right to the top. So let's discuss a bit of option one. They say the radius of the vase is 2.65 centimeters. The base height is one centimeter and the total height of the vase is 15. So the base height. So that's what they're talking about. The base height is one centimeter. So this is part of the total height of the vase. So we will say 15 centimeters minus that one centimeter base, and then the height of the water will be 14 centimeters. Question 312. Quince has stated that option two has exactly two times the capacity of option one. Verify with calculations if a statement is correct. And you may use the following formula. All right, so Quenzi said that option two, the rectangular base vase, um, has exactly two times the capacity of option one. And we need to verify this. So verify means show all your calculations and then come to a conclusion. That's the meaning of verify. So we are first going to work out the volume of option one, which is the cylindrical vase. And remember, the cylindrical vase has got a circle. It's a cylinder, so it will stand. The base will be a circle. So the formula is then pi radius squared times the height, pi radius squared times the height. All right. They gave us the radius. Everything is in centimeters. We're checking that everything is in the same unit of measurement. Now we're going to use our calculator and the volume for option one is 308.91 centimeters cubed. Then we're going to move along to option two, the rectangular base vase. And the rectangular base vase will then stand on a rectangle. So the formula is length times breadth times height. We substitute the length, the breadth, and we will substitute the height. The height is 14. Remember, we worked it out in the previous question because each base got a one centimeter base. We check our measurements are all the same. We use our calculator and the answer is 598.5 centimeters cubed. Now we have worked out the volume of both of these um, vases. So now we need to go and see what's the question. She stated that option two has exactly two times the capacity of option one. So now we need to go and work that out. So we're going to take 598.5 divided by the volume of option one and the answer is 1.94 times. And then we see it's not two times so therefore the claim is not valid. All right, so now we are going to have a look at a question on a swimming pool. A family living in a suburb has a circular swimming pool with dimensions as shown below. The pool is situated in the middle of the yard and it is also has a circular fence around it. The fence is two meters from the pool and below the pool we have lots of information. The question reads, the capacity of the pool is 30,000 liters. Calculate to the nearest meter 
the depth of the pool. So in this question, to the nearest meter is the hint. So everything must be converted to meters for you to answer this question. So our first step will be to convert the 30,000 liters divided by 1,000 to 30 meters cubed. Then we're going to write down the formula for volume, pi radius squared times depth. We are using the word depth because we're working with a swimming pool. Normally, we would say height. Then, what do we have? So in this formula, we're going to substitute what we have. So we have 30 meters cubed. We have pi radius 2.4 squared times the depth. So now, where did we get the 2.4 from? So the diameter was 480 centimeters. We had to convert this 480 centimeters to meters, 4.8. Remember, I said that's our hint. Everything must go to meters. And then that's the diameter in meters. We divided by 2, 2.4 meters. So the radius is 2,4 meters. All right, so we're going to square that. And then we are going to check that all our answers are in meters, meters for us to be able to do the sum. So now we have one missing value, which is the depth of the swimming pool. So we are now going to calculate that. So we are going to say 3.142 times 2.4 squared. And it's going to give us an answer of 18.09792. Um, and now we are going to work out the depth. So in other words, we're going to say 30 divided by 18.09792. And then our answer is 1667. But remember, the question said, calculate to the nearest meter. So to the nearest meter, it will be 2 meters. All right, we are still on the swimming pool question. 312 says, to clean the pool, they use HTH, that's a chemical. The chemical is sold in 10 kilogram bags. They use 40 grams of chemical per 10,000 liters water per day. Verify with the necessary calculations whether the 10 kilogram bag will be enough for March. All right, so again, the word verify five marks for this question so we will definitely need to show our calculations to verify so we need to calculate and then come to a conclusion so they gave us information in the question they said 10,000 liters equals 40 grams they said the chemical is sold in 10 kilogram bags they use 40 grams of chemical per 10,000 liters water per day but remember this pool has got a capacity of 30,000 liters. So we need to work out what are we using per day. So we're going to take the 30,000 divided by 10,000 multiplied by 40. And we get that they will use 120 grams per day of the HDH. But they did ask for the month of March. March has got 31 days. So we're going to say 120 grams per day multiply the 31 days in March, and then for March, they will need 3,720 grams. But the question was given, they ask, is 10 kilograms enough? So we need to convert the grams to kilograms by dividing by 1,000, and then we say it's 3.72 kilograms. So now we can verify and then we can come to the conclusion that 10 kilograms will be enough. All right, so we come to the last question on the swimming pool. The labor cost for the fencing, including the gate, is 125 rand per meter. Calculate the cost for fencing the pool. So what are they actually asking us? We need to calculate the, how much will the fence right around the swimming pool cost us. All right, so we are going to first work out the diameter of the fence. For us to be able to work out the diameter, we need to have a look at a few dimensions. 
So the dimension um, of the diameter of the swimming pool is 480 centimeters. Then we also see that the price is 125 rand per meter. That is our hint in this question that everything needs to be converted to meters. Also important that 480 centimeters will be converted to 4.8 meters. Then they also said the fence is two meters from the pool. So in other words, the diameter of the pool from there to there, 4.8 meters, we add two meters on this side and two meters on that side. So then the diameter of the fence will be 8.8 .8 meters. Now we're going to go and work out the circumference of the fence. Okay, all around the swimming pool. So the formula for the circumference is 2 pi radius or pi times diameter. We have 8.8 .8 meters as a diameter of the fence. We need the radius. So we are going to half that, which will be 4.4 meters. So when we put that into our calculator, the answer will be 27.6496 meters. They did ask for the cost. So we're going to multiply the meters with 125 rand and then the cost of the fence for the swimming pool will be 3,456 rand and 20 cents. We would now recommend that you start with the worksheet, that you try that and that you after that look at the solutions to the worksheet. All right, so Kitsilano Pool is an outdoor saltwater swimming pool located at Kitsilano Beach in Vancouver in Canada. Then there is a photo for you of the pool. It's a rectangular pool with a semicircular island. There's dimensions of the rectangular pool, the radius of the semicircular island. There's a conversion yards to meters or meters to yards. Then they also give you the Olympic size pool volume. They give you the average depth of the pool in the photo, uh, conversion, as well as formulas. The builder estimated that the area of the pool is more than 7,000 meters squared. Verify whether his statement is valid. So by now, you know that when you need to verify something, you need to do calculations, get an answer, and then compare it with a statement made in the question. So in this question, there's a hint for us. The hint is everything needs to be converted to meters. So therefore, we will start by converting the 60 yards to meters. There's the conversion factor. We have yards, we want meters. We go from left to right. We will multiply with the conversion factor. And the answer is 54.864 meters. Then we will work out the area of the swimming pool, the, the whole rectangular part. And the answer will be 7525.146. Then we are going to work out the area of the semicircular part because remember we must cut it out. So we must work it out and deduct it from the area that we worked out of the rectangular part. So the area of the semicircular part is 6 to 8.4 meters squared. And now we are going to subtract it from 7525.146. And then the area of the pool is 6896.75 meters squared. So we remember we work out the whole rectangular part, work out the semicircular part and cut it out. So we subtract it. So we go back to the statement. The, uh, the builder estimated that the area of the pool is more than 7000 meters squared. So it's not. So the statement is invalid or the builder is not correct. Then calculate the volume of an Olympic sized pool as a percentage of the volume of the Kitsilano pool. Give your answer to the nearest percentage. So we are going to bank this door later. We're first going to do the calculation. So we need to work out the volume of the Kitsilano pool because we don't have that, but we do have the volume of the Olympic sized pool. So we first need to work out the volume of the pool in the picture. So remember volume is the base area times the depth or the height. So in the previous question, we did work out the area of the swimming pool. So we're going to use that answer now, which is the base area of the swimming pool. And we're going to multiply it by the depth 
of the Kitsilana pool, which is 1.1 meters. And then our answer is 7586.425 meters cubed. It's volume. All right, now we're going to go and we're going to do the calc um, calculation, the percentage calculation. All right, so they did say calculate the volume of the Olympic size pool. Remember, we're going to calculate percentage, so it will be something over something times 100. So the something over something will be uh, 2,500, which is the Olympic size pool. They do say calculate the volume of the Olympic size pool. There it is. As a percentage, there it is times 100 of the volume of the Kitsilano pool, which we just worked out. Now you're going to type this all into your calculator, and then the answer is 32.9535%. They did say calculate to the nearest percentage. We're going to look at the first digit of the comma. It's a 9, so it will have an influence on the 2, and therefore it is 33%. So we must remember that that answer comes from the previous question. And then they did say we need to round. We just need to make sure because remember, I have on previous occasions told you that if they say give your answer to the nearest percentage, a mark will be allocated for that specific rounding. So the pool is filled weekly with approximately 1 million liters of water. Convert the capacity to volume in meters cube. So we are going to convert the liters to meters cube. So it's 1 million divided by 1,000. So the answer is 1,000 meters cube. All right, so we come to the second example on the worksheet. Pomplemousse Botanical Garden are known for the giant water lilies uh, that grow in the circular shape in the ponds. So each water lily has approximate a radius of 1.25 meters and can support a weight of up to 45 kilograms. The diagram below shows a picture of the water lilies and dimensions of the pond. So the question states, Jody states that the depth of the pond should be less than one meter for the water lilies to grow. Determine the depth of the pond in meters. That of course is the hint. If it has a capacity of 2,285,000 liters of water to verify Jody's statement. All right, so we have the hint. We need to verify. We're going to do some calculations and then we're going to go back to the statement. So this is our hint. So we're going to start off by converting the volume into meters cube. So we're going to take the liters divided by 1,000 and get 2,285 meters cube. Then we are going to work out the volume of the pond and we are going to substitute what we have. So we have the volume of the pond, we have the length, we have the breadth, we don't have the height. So we are now going to multiply 100 times 25 and then the answer is 2,500. Height, remember, is the dimension that we need to work out. So we are now going to take the 2285 divided by the 2500 and then we are going to calculate the height. So the height of the pond is 0 0.914 meters. And now we need to go back to the statement that Jody made. So Jody said, said that um, the depth of the pond should be less than one meter for the water lilies to grow. So therefore the depth is less than one meter and the statement is correct. Assume that each water lily leaf has the same radius. Determine the number of water lily leaves that will fit along the length of the pond. All right, so we need to, the first uh, calculation that we need to do is we need to work out the diameter. So they did say each water lily has an approximate radius of 1.25 meters. So we know that if we take the 1.25 meters, we multiply it by two, we will get the diameter of each water lily and it will be 2.5 
meters. Now we are going to work out the number along the length of the pond. So we can going to take the length of the pond, which is 100 meters, and we are going to divide it by the 2.5 meters, which is the diameter of one water lily. And then we will be able to put 40 water lilies along the length of the pond. B says determine the number of water lilies uh, or water lily leaves that will fit along the breadth of the pond. So now we are going to put them along the breadth. So according to the um, dimensions of the pond, the breadth of the pond is 25 meters. So we're going to take the 25 meters and divide it by the 2.5 meters, the, di the diameter of one water lily, and we will get 10 water lilies along the breadth. And then C, calculate the total number of water lily leaves needed to cover the water surface of the pond. So then we will say the total number, and that will be 40 times 10. So it will be 400 water lilies to cover the surface of the pond. All right, so we are at the last question on the worksheet. Determine how many leaves would support 1.8 tons if each leaf support 45 kilograms. So remember, um, we need to do our weight conversions to kilograms. That's the hint there. Weight in kilo. So we're going to convert from tons to kilo. And we're going to say 1.8 times 1,000. So that will be 1,800 kilograms. And then we are going to work out the number of leaves. And then we're going to do the following. We're going to say 1,800 a kilograms divided by the 45 kilograms, which it can support. So then the number of leaves will be 40. We expect to have some type of plan to work with. So we'll look at a few examples in a bit and then also scale. When we talk about scale, we need to be able to actually identify scales, calculate scales, um, work with scales, perform calculations with scales, etc. Now, the type of plans you can expect are instruction or assembly diagrams, floor or layout plans, elevation plans, design drawings, and last but not least, models or packaging problems. So when we start looking at these things, it's so important for us to remember in these short sessions, we don't have time to go through all the examples, but we hope that you will in your own time, make sure that you go through them all and that you spend some time working through these with us to make sure that you understand the ones that we are indicating. So the first thing we are showing you here is a layout plan or a seating plan of an ice skating rink. So if we look at the first question, it says, write down the number of zones. So one, two, three, four, five. So five zones. Identify the zone that has the least seats. So now we need to go back here and we need to go see, and it's actually quite easy to see. Look how small these blocks are here by A. So the one with the least seats would be zone A. We're going to look at question 2.2.3. It says they determine the zone to which block numbers 101 to 107 belong to. So we go find 101. If we have a look, it's over here. We have 107 and we see this forms part of zone B. If we look at 2.2.4, calculate the total number of blocks in zone A and B. So now you physically would have to go count all these blocks in A and B. And that gives you 32 and 11, which is then 43 blocks in total. Remember, it's not 43 seats. It's 43 blocks. And then normally would be quite a few seats in each Block. So this is when we start looking at stadiums and so on. The last question says, give one reason why you think zone D tickets are the cheapest. Now, grade 12, so if we look at where zone D is found all over here, 
we can see that it's actually the furthest away from this ice skating rink compared to all of the other sections. So it's the furthest away, so people might not have such a nice view and so on. If we look at the next question, here yeah, you'll see the different parts of a nest. We see an assembly diagram, we have dimensions, and we know that this is for Clarence, who is farming with budgies, which is going to sell to generate a profit of 30 rand a breeding pair. And this whole thing is about the nests that he is building. So if I look at my first question, it says, how many wooden parts would you need to build 18 nests? So if I count, I count one, two, three, four, five, six parts is what I will need for one nest. So six times 18 gives me 108. Now, if I look at the next question, it says, explain what is meant by an assembly diagram. Remember, they can always ask you to give definitions and a definition of an assembly diagram. If you look here, you can see more or less what it means. It's labeled pictures or diagrams that demonstrate to you how to assemble a specific item. In this case, the budgie nest. Question 1.2.3 would be write down the number of parts of a nest that has exactly the same size. So it's very important for us to remember if we look at the dimensions, we will look at either the small nest or the large nest, but only one set of these values will be used for this. And we can also, of course, have a look at these diagrams. And when we look here, we know that this and this will be exactly the same because they've got the three same dimensions over here. So how many parts has the exact same size? And in this case, it will be two parts that will have the exact same size. You can also tell from this instruction diagram that you have over here, or once again, you can make use of the measurements. Now, if we look at the next question, it says, write the width W. So we know that we are going to look at this of a small nest to the width of a large nest as a ratio in its simplest form. So because they say small nest first, that will go on the left, so it's 120. Because they say large nest after that, it goes on the right, that's 150. So in this case, we're going to divide them both and we remember what we do on the one side, we must do on the other side. So if I divide them by 30, then I say 120 divided by 30 gives me 4 and 150 divided by 30 gives me 5. Question 1.2.5 says, determine the selling price per breeding pair if the input cost is 95 Rand. So remember what they said here. They said that Clarence farms with budgies and he makes a profit of 30 Rand a pair. So I see there's a little error on here, but nothing to worry about. If the input cost is 95 rand and he makes a profit of 30 rand so the cost price is 95 the profit is 30 rand that means his selling price is going to be 125 rands if we look at the next question it says select an item from column b to match the correct assembly of the budgie nest in column A. So now they are telling us that A, we need to go find out which one of these three steps best indicates. So attach the back pieces to the sides. That's not what's happening in diagram A. Attach the roof. That's not happening in diagram A. 
attach the sides to the base. So the base, remember, is this bottom piece over here. So that is the most likely one. Then for B, if we look at what's happening, it looks the same except this back piece is coming on. So it's going to be this back piece. So in other words, B will be 1 and then C will be 2. So these are also questions where you need to either follow the steps to see what is going to be assembled or you can also be asked to give the steps of an assembly diagram. If we look at the next picture, it tells you that the CEO of a company asked Mr. Smith to build a warehouse where they will store boxes of seed before they sell them to small farmers. Now, here's the rough plan. It says it's not to scale, so we are not using scale, but they are showing you measurements in meters. So, it tells you three of the sides of the warehouse are built of brick and the front will be open for the time being. The roof is covered with metal roof sheeting, which we can see over here. The drawing on the left is a rough plan and is not to scale. The drawing on the right is the right side view. Remember we said elevation plans. So this is a nice example of that. So the first question says, or oh, sorry, explain the meaning of an elevation plan. So it's normally a picture or a diagram of the outside of a building or a structure. And it provides us information regarding the height and any external features. So maybe if there was a window or something, it would have been on there or a door. But in this case, it's just telling us about the height and any external features if present. If we look at 412, it says, use the scale of 1 is to 80 to calculate the actual length in meter of the roof. So we are going to use this scale, but now we are also going to have to measure the roof from here to here. And if it's printed on an A4 page, then we get a measured length of 5,2 centimeters. So in other words, if we use a scale of 1 is to 80, I got 5,2 centimeters on this plan. I will need to take the 5,2, multiply with the scale factor so times 80 and that gives me 416 centimeters but remember grade 12s it's so important for us to read carefully it said in meter we currently have centimeters so we'll divide by 100 and we get a roof length of 4,16 meters question 4.1.3 says the measured length on the plan of the right side of the warehouse is 5 centimeters. So in other words, in 4.1.2, you had to measure on the plan. In 4.1.3, the measurement is provided to you. Now it tells us that the actual length is 4.4 meters, which is what we have over there. Determine the scale. So the first thing we need to remember is we'll always do the plan is to real life. So in this case, we will have the plan being the 5 centimeters is to real life, which is 4,4 meters. But you know you can't have two different units next to each other. So you'll have to convert one of them to the same units as the other. So in this case, I'm going to convert the 4,4 meter to centimeters by multiplying it by 100. So 4,4 times 100 gives me 440 centimeters. Now I have centimeters and centimeters. Always remember that we are not going to have units in our ratio. And if we look at this now, we have 5 is to 440. But now we're going to try get this in a unit ratio. So I'm going to divide on both sides by 5. And then I get 1 is to 88. We would now recommend that you start with the worksheet, that you try that, and that you after that look 
at the solutions to the worksheet. So if we look at the first question, it says Sakila has enrolled at the University of Johannesburg and is renting a bachelor flat in Johannesburg. Then it gives you the floor plan and it gives you an important note where you'll see some measurements and conversions might form part of these questions. So the first question says, write down the number of doors which open into the living area and kitchen. So now we need to find the living area and kitchen. And if we see how many of them open into the living area and kitchen, here's one, here's two, and then we see there's another one that opens in there. So it will be three doors that open into these areas. If we look at the next question, it says, use the given scale. So here we see a scale was provided to calculate the actual length of the bedroom, including the mechanical room. So in this case, we know we'll have to actually take a ruler and measure with our ruler the length of the bedroom. So if I measure, I'll get about 90 millimeters or nine centimeters exactly the same and I'm going to use a scale of 1 as to 100 because I'm going to go from a plan to real life I'm going to multiply by the scale factor so 90 in this case times 100 gives me 9,000 millimeters but now we know they probably won't ask us the length of the bedroom in millimeters so I'll now convert from millimeters to centimeters and from centimeters to meters giving me a length of of nine meters if we look at 413 it says convert the area of the bachelor flat to meters squared so if we look here over here the area is already given in square feet and they tell us that a hundred centimeters squared is 0 0.107639 square feet so something we need to remember is there's many ways that we can use the information that we have so the one thing I did is I looked at the information that was given, the area that was provided, and then the conversion factor. So I know that 100 centimeters squared is 0 0.107639 feet, that is squared. So I know that the area of this flat is 322,36, and I don't know how much it will be in the metric system. So now we remember grade 12s that we can divide up, multiply across, and then we get a value of 299,482,53 centimeters squared. But what we need to remember now is the question didn't ask in centimeters squared. The question asks in meters squared. So many of you might have said, okay, to go from centimeters to meters, I must divide by 100. That's right if you're working in one dimension. But if you're working in two dimensions, you either have to divide by 100 twice, so go divide 100 and then again divide 100, or you divide by 100 to the power of 2, and that now gives me an area of 29,948252296 meters squared. If I look at 4.1.4, it says, Sakile states that he likes an open plan flat. Does this bachelor flat qualify as an open plan flat? Give a reason for your answer. So you first have to say yes or no, and then explain your opinion. So in this case, I would have said yes, because there are no walls between the dining area and then the kitchen and the living area. This is all an open space plan. If we look at the next question, there we had a seating plan of the Cape Town Stadium. The first question says, determine the direction in which a person will face when leaving through entrance three. So remember, we go look for entrance three over here. And if we look at this, it says provide a reason for your answer. So when we look at that, the answer is going to be east because all of these v &A waterfront, Beach Road, Granger Bay, all of that is on the eastern side of the Cape Town Stadium. 
Now, if we move on to the next question, determine the probability as a percentage. So it's giving us all this information we need of randomly trying to get a seat in blocks 401 to 403. So if I go find 401 to 403 over here, so here 401, 402, 403, over here I can see the number of seats out of all the seats in the stadium. So here's the total seats available. I can get the number of seats in each block from there. So if I add together 401, 2 and 3, the number of seats, I get 1,066 seats. I have the total number of seats. So it's 1066 over the 52,286. Then we know they want it as a percentage. So multiplied by 100 gives me 2,04%. The last question you had to do said, determine the scale. So once again, we're working out scale. Round it to the nearest 100 of the layout plan if the length of the playing field is 125 meters. So what we need to know now again is if they give you the real length, we are now going to measure with our pencil and our ruler and we get about 8,5 centimeters if it's printed on A4 or if you were working on an A4 version. So now we know that the distance on the map or on the plan is 8,5 centimeters and that is represented by 125 meters in real life. So what we need to remember grade 12s is that we can't have these different units so we'll convert the meters to centimeters by multiplying by 100 so now I have 8,5 is to 12,500 I'm working in the same unit so I can scratch it out and now I have if I divide both sides by 8,5 then I have 1 is to 1470,588,235. But I need to remember they asked me to round to the nearest 100. So it will be 1 is to 1,500. Right. Um, so straight into definitions. Um, scale. Scale drawings represent the actual size and shape of an object on paper. And this is actually also on, on a map. Right, each dimension of the actual object is either reduced or enlarged by a certain ratio, which is called a scale factor. Right, um, straight into the types of scales that we have. So basically, there are two types of scales that we're going to deal with. The first one is called a bar scale, and the second one is called a number or a ratio scale. Right, with your bar scales, there's also um, another term that we use for bar scales. They're also referred to as linear scales. And there's two examples of bar scales that I've drawn. And as you know, with the bar scale, you need to take your ruler and you actually measure. So in the first one that I have there, one centimeter on the ruler represents four kilometers on the ground. Okay, and in the second one, um, the second example that I have there, one centimeter um, on the ruler, or in other words, on the map, will represent um, six kilometers in reality. Okay. Right, I'm just going to go into more detail on bar scales, just a little bit of more detail. Right, by measuring the map distance between two points and comparing this distance with the bar scale of the map, you are able to work out the distance between two points in reality. We're going to go through an example where we're going to do this. Right, um, when it comes to bar scales, units are very, very important. And the reason for that is that um, bar scales show a very specific relationship between the measured length of the line segments on the bar scale and the actual length. So, which means when you are transferring the measurement from the map, the map will be given in centimeters mostly. It can also be given in millimeters, but that will be the measurement on your ruler. So you need to be very specific about the units on the ruler or on the map, which is normally in centimeters, okay? And that is used to represent the 
distance in reality, which is normally given in meters or in kilometers, depending on context. So units are very, very important when it comes to bar scales. Right, now we move on to the next um, type of scale, which is called number scales. Right, and your number scales are always written in the form 1 is to 100 without any units. Now, what does this mean? This means that for every one unit on the map, it is equivalent to a hundred units in reality. Um, one important point to note here is that the scale is written in the form of a ratio, which is like one is to hundred, like the example that I've given there, which implies that you are comparing equivalent units, which means the one and the hundred are both in the same units. Therefore, there is no particular units that are given in number scales. You will notice that the one and the hundred, there is no specific units there. Right, then there is a very important term that learners need to understand and also be able to apply. Um, and this term is referred to as, as the crow flies. So when a question asks you for the distance, as the crow flies, what this means is that this is the shortest straight line distance between any two points. Okay, so if um, the question asks for about um, the distance as the, crow, as the crow flies between A and B or between point A and point B, what you need to do is just to draw a straight line that connects those two points and measure that straight line distance. That will be the distance between point A and point B as the crow flies. Right, getting on now, um, dealing with maps, a map is a two-dimensional representation of an area of the Earth's surface, which is, um, for example, a country, a street map, a building map, um, and so on and so on. A plan is a more detailed representation of a smaller area, often showing landmarks or objects, house plans, cinema, sitting plan, sports stadiums, shopping malls, um, and stuff like that. Right, then relative position is used when describing your position or directions to someone in relation to surrounding landmarks. Right, um, so straight into the worked examples, I'm going to start with the first one here. But before I do this, let me just explain something that happens when it comes to um, questions that relate to scales and maps. So you can be asked one of Three. Okay, the first one is they will give you the map distance and ask you to come up with the real distance. So obviously the scale will be given in that particular case. And then the second one, they will give you the real distance and ask you to calculate or to come up with the map distance. And also in this um, kind of a question, you will be given the scale. The third type is that they will give you the, both the map distance and the real distance and then they will ask you to come up with the scale. Okay, so you need to be familiar with all three types that, um, all three types of questions that you can face when it comes to maps and scales of this type. Right, um, so straight into the question that we have at hand, it says a map is drawn on a scale of one is to 50,000, and part A says calculate the exact distance in kilometers of a distance represented by eight centimeters on the map. Okay, so obviously, um, because we're moving from the map distance to the real distance, this is from small to big, which means in this case, we have to multiply by the scale factor, which is 50,000 in this case. So we take our eight centimeters, which is the distance on the map, multiply by 50,000, and we get to an answer of 400,000 centimeters. And then because the question requires us to give the answer in kilometers, then we must just convert the 400,000 centimeters into kilometers. And we do that by dividing by 100,000, which will give us an answer of four kilometers. Right, then we move on to part B of the question. Um, and the question reads, the actual distance between two places is 2,000 500 meters. What is the distance in millimeters between these two places on the map? Right, so this is the second type where we are given the actual distance and we must come up with the map 
distance that represents that actual distance but now on the map right so the very first thing that you need to realize here is that um, the final answer is required in millimeters and the 2500 is meters okay so um, I've always made this suggestion that because your answer your final answer is required in millimeters I'd rather take the 2500 meters and convert it into millimeters okay so that you can work with um, the unit that is required in the final answer okay I think it's always easier to do that rather than um, calculating in meters and then you try to convert at the end okay so we have our 2500 meters if we convert it into millimeters we multiply by a thousand and then we'll get two million five hundred thousand millimeters so this number here two million five hundred thousand millimeters means exactly the same thing as the 2500 meters so which means we're still um, looking at the distance the actual distance right because now we're trying to navigate from the actual distance to the map distance so we're moving from the big one to the smaller one which means in this case we have to divide by the scale factor which is 50,000 okay so therefore the map distance will be the 2,500,000 divided by 50,000 and because um, our number the 2,500,000 is already in millimeters so it means our final answer is already going to be in millimeters so our final answer is 5 millimeters and that is the answer for that specific question okay guys um so moving on to the last question that i have um and the question reads a leader is a grade 12 learner who lives in Krua drink in the northern cape she intends studying at a university in bloomfontein she and her parents plan to attend university's open day for prospective students a map on annex b shows part of the northern cape free state and surrounding areas okay then use annex b to answer the questions that follow um 4.1.1 write down the general direction from bloomfontein to crew drink i'm just going to indicate here where is our bloomfontein so bloomfontein is over here and crew drink is over there so our general direction seeing that this is the north okay the north is above so this is an easier map to deal with um, always if your north is above then it's easier to deal with that particular map okay so the general direction from Bloemfontein to Hruet drink will be given by north west that will be in the north westerly direction for your two marks and then moving on to question 4.1.2 which says state the national road they will use to travel to Bloemfontein so remember your national roads they start with the letter N okay your um, provincial or regional roads they start with the letter R and your metro roads they start with the letter M right so the road that they're going to be using from Hrue Drink to Bloemfontein is definitely our N8 I hope my map is clear enough there but you can see here that this is N8 eight that they are going to be using in that um travels in those travels okay then we move on to 4.1.3 and the question is write down the name of the third town they will pass en route to bloemfontein the name of the third town right so obviously i think i need to use my laser for this one right so they're going to come from here and go all the way to Bloemfontein using this route that I've indicated with my laser, right? So this is the very first town that they're going to pass. And then the second one is this one. So the third one, there is the third city indicated there that they are going to pass. And the correct answer there will be Campbell. Campbell will be the third city or the third town they will pass en route to Bloemfontein right then we move on to the next question which is 4.1.4 and it says a leader and her parents will leave who a drink at four in the morning to travel a distance of 496.9 kilometers to Bloemfontein determine to the nearest kilometer per hour the average speed they must travel to be in Bloemfontein at 930 
and you may use the following formula um, average speed is equal to distance over time right so the very first thing that we need to do there in question 4.1.4 is to determine the total time that they are going to take we know that uh, they're leaving at 4 in the morning and they need to arrive at 9 30 so that trip is going to take five hours and 30 minutes but remember five hours and 30 minutes is the same as five comma five hours and not 5,3. Please don't make that mistake of writing this as 5,3. Remember 30 minutes is 30 over 60 as an hour which will give you half an hour. So that will give us 5,5 hours and if we are going to make that um, substitution then we'll take the distance of 496,9 kilometers divided by 5,5 hours and we'll get to a speed of 90.345 kilometers per hour. And because this question requires us to round off to the nearest kilometer per hour, which is the same as round off to the nearest um, number, um, to the nearest whole number. Okay, so that will give us an answer of 90 kilometers per hour after the rounding, of course. Okay. Right, so that will be the final answer for that question, and that is it for this particular presentation. We would now recommend that you start with the worksheet, that you try that, and that you after that look at the solutions to the worksheet. Right, um, so the very first question that we had there, um, and it pertains to four teenagers that we that decided to take a walk through the village before it became too dark and the question says use the map on annex b to answer the following question so i'm assuming that you have already gone through the map and you know exactly what this question is about so i'm just going to go straight to the question and it says by making use of the scale below calculate the estimated distance the teenagers walked right so as you can see the type of scale that is um on this particular question is a bar scale and um, to calculate distances on a bar scale what we need to do is we take a ruler I'm just going to indicate with um, with the laser here you take your ruler and you put it there and you measure the distance from the beginning up to the very end of that bar you can you don't actually have to take um, until the end you can take until any point that is um, clear and straightforward so you can even use the 450 or you can use the 150 and obviously the one in the middle there is a 300 okay so that if that is a clear point on your ruler I'm saying if it gets to exactly a specific number on your ruler on that particular number on the bar scale then you can use that but I've always preferred to use the very end of that bar so i've already measured and for for me from my ruler from the beginning until the very end there is a 3.2 centimeter measurement on my ruler so what that means is that 3.2 centimeters on the ruler represents 600 meters in reality okay um the other thing that i've also already done is to measure the walked distance um by the boys so you just connect um, from the map, the distance that the boys walked, according to my calculation, I saw that it was six centimeters. Okay, I'm going to give an allowance here of plus or minus 0 0.5. So, which means if the walked distance, if you measured and you saw that it was 5,5 up, up to 6,5 that is within the tolerance range um, so that is acceptable so you can use those numbers right so i did mention that um, 3.2 centimeters on my ruler is the same as 600 meters in reality okay so if it is like that then we um, must calculate now what six centimeters on the map represents in reality okay so for those of you that have watched the presentations that have um, preceded this one you will see that um what method i'm going to use here is that we divide up that is to say we divide similar units and then we multiply across so we're starting at the six centimeters going up to 3.2 so which means we take six centimeters divided by 3.2 centimeters and then we multiply across by the 600 
meters to find the missing number that we have there. So our actual distance, it will be six centimeters divided by 3,2. And then um, the answer that we get, we multiply by 600. Okay, and then this will give us an answer of 1,125 meters, which we can still convert and give it in kilometers as 1,125 kilometers. But that wasn't really specified within the question. So you could have left your answer as 1,125 and that would be perfectly fine. But of course, if you used um, a different number for the distance walked. If you used 5,5, 6,5, then of course your answer is going to be different. And also if you measured instead of the 3,2 that I got, if you got anything between 3 centimeters and 3,4 centimeters, that's also within the tolerance range. So you see that um, a question like this, as long as you have more or less um, an answer like mine, that would be um, acceptable depending on your measurement on your ruler. Right, um, so moving on to this question, right, and it reads, after walking and talking for a while, the youngsters realized they were lost. They phoned the group leader and explained that they were in front of the Fountain Place guest house, indicated as GH on the map, on the corner of Berry and Mill Streets. Write down instructions for a possible route they can walk to the backpackers indicated as BP on the map in Bree Street. Right, so um, I've already indicated with an orange line there the route that they need to take to get to the place where they want to be from the place where they are. Obviously, this is not the only route. These other routes that you can use, but I have chosen to use this specific route. Okay, and uh, before I go on to explain this route, um, whenever you get a question that requires you to give directions from one place to the next, you need to make sure that you include words like, um, or you are very specific, you need to be as specific as possible. So the words that you need to include are, you turn right into Loop Street or turn left into Mill Street. You need to provide the specific direction of turn and the name of the road in which you are turning. Okay, that is very, very important because those are the key words that we look for when we allocate marks. Okay, right, so the answers that I've given for this specific question is that from the corner where they are, they need to turn left into Berry Street. Okay, so here I'm assuming that they are turning left um, but you can also say 10 right. It all depends on what, you, what direction you are assuming that the boys are facing. Okay, so from the direction that I'm assuming that they are facing, um, they need to turn left into Berry Street. Once that is done, then they need to continue straight past Four Tracker and Long Street, and then turn right into Baton Cant, and then continue straight past Loop, Contour, Tindall, and Kirk Streets. Okay, and once that is done, they will see the backpackers on the right hand side. So, this is the specific directions that I've given for this specific question. But remember, as I said before, there is more than one um, route that the boys can take to get to where they want to get to. Right, moving on to the next question. Right, and it reads, Mr. M has to travel from his home in Cape Town to receive a teaching award in Bloemfontein. He leaves his house at 11.30 a.m. and travels along N1. It takes him nine hours and 15 minutes to get to Bloemfontein. Use the strip map in Annex B to answer the questions that follow. And then for question 4.1, and it, it says, what time did Mr. M arrive in Bloemfontein? Okay, so for this specific question, we know that he left Cape Town at 11.30, and um, he was driving for 9 hours and 15 minutes to get to Bloemfontein. So if we take the 11.30 plus 9 hours and 15 minutes, we will get to a time of... 20, 45 hours, obviously giving it as um, time in the 24 hour notation. 
you more than welcome to give your answer is um, 12 hour in 12 hour notation but then you need to make sure that you write it as 8 45 p.m you need to make sure that you include p.m if you just write 8 45 without the p.m you're going to lose marks because you need to indicate to us that you know that he arrived there in the night or in the evening rather right so that is the answer to 4.1 then moving on to 4.2, and it says, determine the distance from Colesburg to Balfour West. Okay, so I'm just going to explain what happens with a strip map. You can see the strip map that we have on the screen there. It's called a strip map or a strip chart. Right, so according to a strip map or a strip chart, what you have on the left-hand side is the distance from Cape Town all the way to Bloemfontein. So, the zero here, it indicates that this person has not yet left Cape Town because this is the distance from Cape Town. So when we get to Paul, you will see that we have a 52 here, which indicates that from Cape Town, Paul is 52 kilometers away. Okay. And Worcester is 102 kilometers away from Cape Town. Now, if you look on the left hand side, there's also numbers, but these numbers are indicating the distance from the other place, the distance now from Bloemfontein on N1. Okay, so now this means Paul is 947 kilometers away from Bloemfontein, in as much as Paul is 52 kilometers away from Cape Town. Okay, so basically what it also means is, is that if we take this 52 and we add the 947, we should get to 999, which is the distance between Cape Town and Bloemfontein. This applies for any two numbers that are on the same line, okay? Because one indicates the distance from Bloemfontein, in other words, um, the distance between that particular place and Bloemfontein. And the other one, it represents the distance that must still be covered to get to Cape Town. Okay, so I hope that distinction is clear. Right, so the answer to our question that we need here, I'm just going to indicate Balfour West is right here and Colesburg is right there. And then the distance that we need, right, we know that um, Balfour West is indicated as being 460 kilometers away from Cape Town and Colesburg is 778 kilometers away from Cape Town. So which means the distance between the two places that I've um, circled there will be um, 778 minus 460, which will give us 318 kilometers. But you can also use the two numbers that are on the left hand side because this year indicates the distance between Bloemfontein and Beaufort West on N1. Okay, and then this one here, it indicates the distance between Bloemfontein and Korsberg. So also, if you subtract 544 minus 226, you will get exactly the same answer, which is 318. Right, then we move on to the next question, which is 4.3, and it says, hence, calculate Mr. M's average speed for the trip to Bloemfontein. Right, we do know that speed is indicated as distance over time, and the distance between Cape Town and um, Bloemfontein is 999 kilometers, according to the strip map that we have here. Okay, and then we need to divide by the time it took Mr. M to drive um, the, between the two places. And we know that the time was given as 9 hours and 15 minutes. Please don't make a mistake of saying, nine hours 15 minutes is the same as 9 comma 15 hours that is incorrect remember the 15 represents the number of minutes and whenever we are substituting the time into the speed distance and time formula the time must only be in hours or it must only be in minutes okay so to convert the time from hours and minutes which is nine hours 15 minutes into hours only we take the nine hours and then we take the 15 minutes, we divide that 15 by 60, and that will give us 0 0.25. So in other words, 9 hours and 15 minutes is the same as 9,25 hours. So if we divide the 999, which is the distance, divided by the time of 9,25 hours, 
we will get to a speed of 108 kilometers per hour, which is the speed, um, the average speed that Mr. M used to travel from Cape Town to Bloemfontein. Right, I hope that is clear. Grade 12s, thank you so much for joining us for this session. We hope that you managed to get all the solutions of the worksheet correct. And we thank you so much for joining us and spending your time with us. Good luck to all of our learners and continue to work and study hard. And we hope that you get all the results that you've been working towards this year.